Hi, I'm Dr. Gemma, and welcome back to Cognitive, the Knitting Psychology Podcast. Cheerfully and somewhat irregularly in business since 2008. Segments today may include what's on my hooks, needles, and spindles, a strategy, something I really like, put a lid on it, oh shoot, and blather. So sit back, put your feet up, pick up your knitting, crocheting, spinning, weaving, or dyeing, (laughs) or any other yarny thing you're doing, and get ready to enjoy. Well, hi there, it's Dr. Gemma, and this is episode 115 of the new series of Cognitive. Please be aware that your comments are very welcome. You can comment on the blog at cognitivepodcast.blogspot.com or you can comment on our group on Ravelry. I'm still being spammed by robo-accounts, so I'm not going to add you to any of my social media groups, and I'm really sorry about that, but that's why you can contact me through Ravelry or on our blog. In the warm thanks department, I do cherish your comments, and I rather enjoyed them this week. I want to start with, I hope I'm saying this right, Sage Pecos. It was really great to hear your voice, and I really enjoyed the fact that you loved on the pet pics. Thank you very much. Kathy in San Jose points out that it is Moro Fleece Works, not Moro Bay Fleece Works. So that's always useful. We do strive to get it right around here at Cognitive. Ah, Knitting Hiker, it's always great to hear from you. Yes, I am pretty cautious about the idea that any one diet is going to fit everyone. At the same time, when you are a type 2 diabetic, it is always good to hear that somebody is having success that lasts for longer than a few months on one diet. So you might have to take some of that with a grain of salt, but I'll come back to it, as you know I always will. But Minerva does send love to Nora. Turbo Gale, just a big warm hug. It's always nice to see you, and I like your comments. Nice to hear from you. You know the dance and the song about COVID. I was pleased to hear that somebody told me last week as a result of the podcast, they went and got their shingle shot, and I believe a flu shot. It's true. I'm 62 years old. I'm really in favor of shooting yourself up on any medication they'll give you. No, but all joking aside, it's that time of year that flu and RSV and very nasty colds and COVID, they're all out there. Everybody and their cousin has had COVID this year. It really shows how we have adjusted to it because people are making a very small deal out of it, even though they're saying they had really painful COVID. So I guess we've gotten kind of used to it. But, you know, get all the shots. It's interesting, too. I went for my physical last week and I thought, well, you're hearing so many negative things in the media about the newest shot that's supposed to cover the two variants. Oh man, I'll tell you, my medical facility, they were totally in to get that shot. She was really happy to see that I had it. So I don't know, maybe it's scare tactics in the media, but I am happy to be vaxxed out the wazoo. And meanwhile, you may be wondering, since this was a knitting psychology podcast, what is on my hooks and needles? Well, you remember the stash toss last week Part of the stash toss, of course, before I even did the Romule 22 sweater, was going through and finding all my blue scraps. And what happened was I found a lot of blues that aren't scraps exactly, that they were there for other reasons. One of them was this insanely beautiful gradient, and I believe it was Bee Mice Elf. And it was a gradient fiber that I spun, and it goes from a purple that is so dark it's almost black through all these beautiful blues into a turquoise. The photo doesn't do it credit, but what does do it credit was it was in three separate little balls in my stash, all kind of huddling together and like stuffed in each other and fortunately well labeled. I had never even added it to my official stash on Ravelry. I don't know what came over me there. But anyway, there it was and it was sitting in my blues basket that I was using to store the blue yarns I was using on the Romeo 22 sweater. And it was just sitting there and I realized this is a gradient. It's a sport weight or DK, somewhere between. 
And there's no way I can make this work in the sweater without losing track of the really marvelous gradient. And there was an awful lot of it. I had registered it as about 300 yards, and that seems about right. So, you know, I thought, no, oh, I don't want another hat. And I looked at it and I said, I think it's a silk wool, and I think there's a lot of it. And so I whipped out my trusty crochet hook. I believe it was an eye hook. And I just sat down and did me a calm cow. This was so much fun. I had really lost sight of my crochet because I'm doing so much sweater knitting. And so I just sat in bed one night listening to one of my books on tape and crocheting away on the calm cow. And you can see the links in the show notes. I highly recommend this pattern. If you are spinning gradient yarn, go get the free pattern on Ravelry, download it and adjust it based on your yarn size, but it makes an infinity cowl. It's just a terrific thing. It's about two worsted weight cowls worth of yarn to make the complete thing. I've just made it in about every weight at this point. The calm cow is just a neat trick and it does really, really well with your gradient skeins. It's a very nice thing to work with. So that came together really fast that I just sat down. I can't even tell you one which night it was, Saturday night or I can't remember if it was Friday night or Saturday night, but I just sat down and hooked away while sitting in bed. You can see in the picture I'm wearing my favorite bed sweater, my pullover that I like to wear to bed on cold nights. And I'm wearing the beautiful gradient, which I had just finished. I believe it must have been Saturday night, and then I finished it Sunday morning before I even got out of bed because I was so close to the end. So that is a fantastic thing. And again, the Calm Cow is one of my template patterns. It's something that I use all over the place to use up yarn when I want to. I am wearing that cowl right now as I speak. It stretched when I blocked it. It was very, very dusty. And so I had to wash it, and then it really just stretched. So now it goes around my neck three times. I don't mind. I'm really enjoying it. It's very, very pretty. Ah, yes, in progress. Here's where the guilt begins, because I jumped the gun on what is my annual project in February that is a vest, because we all know that February is vestuary. In the shortest month, we make the smallest sweater, basically. And again, this was another result of the stash toss that led me to all my blue scraps for the Romeo sweater. And I think I may have said this before, as I was hunting around, I came out with a fantastic set of three skeins of Cascade, I think it's Quattro, and it's just beautiful stuff. They don't make it anymore. I did go looking around on Ravelry to see if anybody had some for sale, but I got this glorious colorway 13 years ago now, almost 13. And it is four strands. Each strand is a different color, and I believe one strand may be llama. But one strand is a pale blue, one is a lilac, one is emerald green, and one is a pale green. The overall effect is of this kind of light steel blue. But if you look at the pictures in the show notes, you will see my progress on it. I have four inches of I'm doing it bottom up. I have four inches of the one by one rib at the bottom, and then I've got another few inches. I think at this point I'm at about six inches of the stockinette part. I'm using the basic vest from Ann Budd's book, The Knitter's Handy Book of Patterns. This is one of my template patterns. And I also put in a picture of a close up of the swatch so you can actually see how extraordinary the colors are up close. This is one of those vests that unless the camera is an inch away from your body as you wear the vest, you will never see an accurate photo of this vest in action. At any rate, so I went through my stash looking for my blues, and there were these three skeins, and that told me right away there's got to be a fourth. I must have been thinking of at least a vest. I just don't buy three random skeins of a worsted. And so sure enough, in the big stash toss that I did, I found the fourth skein. In fact, I was looking for the fourth skein and that led to what I'm calling stash toss 2023 last week, where I went through all the bins and sorted out stuff. And so I did find that fourth skein. Interesting thing, all of the skeins are intensely dusty. And so they're kind of sticky. 
and they shouldn't be. So I'll be washing this baby as soon as I'm finished with it and blocking it. However, that got very interesting because I knitted four inches of the one by one ribbing that goes at the bottom of the vest. And I got all four inches done and I was just about to start the stockinette and I looked at the inside of the rib and there, right at the place where the round begins, was a big loop of extra yarn just hanging down in the middle of the rib right there at the join. I don't know what that was about or how it got there. I, I went down, I dropped stitches down all the way down to that loop. Nope, it was just extra yarn just sitting there. I didn't have a big enough loop to weave it in. I could have just cut it and woven the ends in. Didn't have quite long enough for that. So meanwhile, I go online and I see Jasmine Knitmore and she was ripping out her Romule 22 sweater. And she explains that on their podcast. She does intend to rebuild it. It was a, a mistake. And I thought, well, I understand that feeling. And something about it, I watched her rip it out. She filmed it and accelerated the speed. Very charming. And I watched that and I said, I can't do that. I can't do that. And I went to bed and in my dreams, I dreamt of ripping it out. And I woke up in the morning understanding that I was meant to rip it out. And so I did, but then a beauteous thing happened. As I ripped, now remember this is a one by one rib. So the purl stitches recede to the back and the knit stitches poke out to the front. Well, as I ripped, I was getting this nice sort of sawtooth of live stitches. And I began to realize they are not dropping or unraveling. They were so dusty that they were stiff and that was holding them in position. And I was going to rip the whole thing out and I thought, oh, I just don't have the energy to cast on 200 stitches. And then I realized I don't have to. These guys are great. They're all just standing up in their dusty, stiff way. So it's true, I ripped down to row 10, realized I had passed the deadly loop and reabsorbed it into the skein. And then I was knitting the ribbing on size seven needles. Well, I took a size, I think it was a four, that I had lying around. So I used a much smaller needle to pick up the stitches. And when I say pick up the stitches, what I really mean is I took that loop, I stood it up on the floor of my study, and I crouched over it with my teeny size four needle, and I simply threaded it through the loops as they were there, perfectly erect, sticking up like a little jagged fence at the top of those 10 rows. And so it was amazing because I didn't get discouraged at all. I didn't miss a single stitch. They all came out perfect. They all lined up beautifully on the needles. And then when I had the size four all the way through all 200 of them, I located where the actual beginning had been based on like the very bottom edge of the cast on row. I located where the start of it was and I worked my way around to that. I just moved the stitches around on the needle and then I picked up my size seven and I knit off that size four. When you look at the stitches, you actually don't see it. In the picture, it looks like you're looking at it, but I don't see it. It's not sort of in the wrong place. It came out perfect is what I'm saying. And I was so happy because there I was with 10 of my 24 rows of one by one rib alive and well. And so now I've got in total, I've got four rows of that rib and a total of like 10 rows. And I think I'm trying to get to about 13 and a half before I do the armholes. So I am a really happy camper. I finished one complete skein of the Quattro and I have three skeins to go. I'm going to have plenty of yarn for this and it's going to be beautiful, but boy, is it going to be dusty. So I jumped the gun. Tomorrow is February 1st. This is January 31st at 7.25 p.m. as I record this. And I am already a quarter of the way through my vestuary project. I noticed when my memories on Facebook came up the day after I started this year's vestuary, I looked in Facebook memories and found that on that day a year ago, I cheated and started vestuary 2022. 
you may remember that one. It came out fantastic. It was in Malabrigo Rios. Um, what is that called? Heaven and Earth. Um, Cielo y Tierra. And it just came out phenomenal and the fit was perfect. So I will be using that same set of notes on the current one. So yes, I have started Vestuary a little bit early and I'm working on my February of 23 vest. And I am really, really liking it. Now you're saying, but what about all those other projects? I mean, these are two totally new projects. I know. I was consumed with guilt, but not enough to return to the lane splitter. However, I have been cooking right along on the don't know yet. You may remember I've got row six pinned onto the main body, rows one through five that is. And then row seven I had clipped together. Well now I spent last week just seaming row seven. So row seven is now a complete seamed row waiting to be clipped on to the body of the thing. And that means currently I am working on the long seam that joins row six to the big block of rows one through five. This continues to be horrifyingly satisfying as projects go. And now the body of it is so big I have to roll it up to keep it in my study under the desk. But I'm looking at it right now and it just brings me so much joy. I should also mention as I am joining the rows onto the body of the blanket, you know, the first block of the blanket, I am weaving in all the ends. So when I say I've got five rows completely seamed, that means the ends are all weaved in. And row six, I have not yet started weaving in those ends. But this is one of those projects where you have to keep weaving ends in as you go or you will run stark raving mad. But anyway, I got some good work done on the don't know yet and that has made me happy. I did locate row eight. I found the project bag that is full of row eight. It is sitting here at my feet. I have not yet clipped row eight together. Right now I just want to get through joining row six with a long seam and then clipping row seven on and then I will probably this weekend or else Thursday morning, spread out row eight and make sure I've got it right and then start clipping that together to do those short seams. The total blanket is 19 blocks wide by 19 rows long. So each row is 19 squares and I'm doing those short seams between them and then doing the long seam to join it. I have to tell you, if you're going to do this kind of project, I would really advise doing it the way I'm doing it. It is really reducing confusion. In other words, I could clip together all 19 rows. Then I could sew all those short seams and have 19 rows all sewn together but not arranged into a blanket. That's one way to do it. I really was just kind of messing around and needed to seam, just had that mood upon me when I started seaming the long seams of row one to row two. And to my shock, that made me extremely happy that having the long completed rows seam together along the long edge and then being able to weave in ends gave me so much satisfaction. And you always have the sense that you're making the ending of the blanket a lot easier, that the finishing is going to be so much easier if you just weave in ends as you go along and connect the long sides of the rows as you go along instead of just making short seams for 19 individual rows, if that makes any sense. So it's very exciting and I'm looking at it with love as we sit here. In the meantime, I was so full of love that I actually went to the Wrapped in Tiny Chains crocheted cardigan. And I've done two small skeins of that yarn. The yarn's only like 100 yards per skein. This is a now defunct yarn that was a blend of alpaca and acrylic, primarily acrylic, beautiful color, really nice hand. And so it's, it's very satisfying. And this is the Wrapped in Tiny Chains. The link is in the show notes. This woman designs a lot of cardigans in relatively simple crochet stitches. And she tends to just design in rectangles and you just do a pretty stitch in each rectangle and then you mattress stitch the rectangles together. And they come out looking great. She's not a big presence on Ravelry and most of the people on her followers group on Facebook don't even use Ravelry. And that is the problem with us crocheters. A lot of us have not embraced Ravelry. So the pattern library that they could have 
Not so much compared to knitting, but it's a lovely, lovely pattern. It's a great way to use scrap yarn. I am not doing that. I am using up some very old yarn from about 2008 in my stash. The donated yarn that some of you will remember when Michaels donated all those cartons to a children's agency and the agency was going to throw them out. And instead we ended up distributing them among our knitting group up in the Antelope Valley. So there it is. I'm still working my way through that. But it's nice because on the tiny chains there's a big back, which I'm done. There's two front panels. They are the next largest pieces and they're like a third the size of the back. And I'm almost finished the second panel. After that, the arms are very short and straightforward. And then there's patch pockets. And these are all crocheted flat and you seam them together. But as you can probably tell, me and my seaming, I have made my peace with it. And so I'm just looking forward to seaming this thing and putting it together. It should be, I hope, ready for the spring. You know, a very nice spring thing to have. The Pennsylvania Dutch Embroidery and the Lady Eleanor No Love This Week and my favorite resources are all listed for you. It is Birch and Cedar, by the way. I'm waiting for that delivery for my latest pile of custom leather tags, which I'm quite loving. Dizzy Blondes. I am not doing anything special in the spinning. I'm more trying to knit up my old hand spun before I add to the hand spun stash. So that's nice. A strategy. Now I know I've been talking about interpersonal strategies and I plan to move forward on that because I had a lot of requests to talk about apologies again. So I'm going to get to that. However, the theme of this week in my therapy practice has been motivation. This has been an issue for my entire life as far as I can tell. Everybody worries with it. But since the quarantine, a lot of people got unmotivated just sitting at home, worrying about their finances, I imagine. And I hear this over and over again in therapy. I just can't get motivated. Motivation is a very tricky thing in therapy. People come to therapy and say, you should motivate me. That's actually more in the realm of life coaching than actual psychotherapy. But I'll give it a whirl. The important thing is, I am a cognitive behavioral therapist, as I've said many times. And so to be honest, I don't believe in motivation. That may sound odd, but I believe instead that you get your life together. That is, you take care of yourself, you exercise, you eat in a reasonable way, you sleep enough, and you do mindful activities like knitting, playing music, crafting, creating things, or good old fashioned meditation. I don't believe you need to motivate yourself. I believe if you do good self maintenance, you will be motivated. However, I also think a key part of motivation rests in time management. So if you want motivation, I would look at it from a very different lens. I would not say, oh, you're not motivated. But people say, oh, but I can't get my project started. Or, oh, I, I want to design a video game, but I just can't seem to sit down and do it. And I look at that as your time management is messed up and you are not thinking about the end game. You're using a small perspective. So let's talk about where all that comes from. The first thing is you have to know what you want to get done. And this comes right out of the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. So you write a list of everything you want to get done. And then in a lot of management books, they say, now you prioritize. And I wouldn't do that. I would go with what the author of The Seven Habits says, that you are going to divide everything you have to do into four categories. And the categories are based on how urgent they are and how important they are to you. So if I look at my day, I'm looking at my list in fact right now, and on my list of things to get done today, I had four patients, patients notes, texting tomorrow's patients to warn them that we have a session coming up, doing my preps for tomorrow's notes, working on my knitted vest, working on my crocheted chains cardigan, working on the seams on my don't know yet blanket. And I say, take one thing off my desk and then clean the Roombas. 
I have a couple phone calls to friends. I have scheduling a mammogram. I have Minerva going to the vet for her annual. Captain, I have to make an appointment for her to go back and have her nose inspected. Queenie has to be spayed. I have checked my financial progress, look at the loans and everything. I've cleaned the litter box. And then I have two patients I need to update their goals and I need to send in my payroll report for this pay period. And I need a blood draw. That's quite a lot of stuff. All right, so I'm not gonna get all that done in one day. But what I do instead is I divide my day. And so everything is based on, is this urgent or not urgent? Is this important or not important? So under what is important and urgent, that's what you do first every day. You wanna book through that. Well, the easy one for me is my patients. They are urgent and they are important. I have to see them exactly at their appointment time. So those are gonna be done at their time each day on the schedule. They are the thing I must do. And so then I go down my list and I say, well, texting tomorrow's patients. That is important but it's not urgent. I've basically got all day today to do that because I want to give them about 24 hours warning before their session. So that is important, but it is not urgent. As I go down the list, let me see, I have my knitted vest. That is not urgent and it is not important. I can in fact take years on it if I want to. Now, because I have created this artificial schedule of vestuary, it is somewhat it's not urgent, but it's not important, but I do want it done by February 28th. So that would be not important and eh, not urgent, but kind of. Okay, so these aren't always clean divisions. Now I look at my chains, Cardi, I don't care. I could spend the rest of my life on that. And the same with doing the seams on my blanket. I'd like to get it done, but they're not urgent and they're not that important to me. Now you may note in this, the flexibility, that I can look at any of my craft projects. Like this week, I looked at the chains cardigan and said, that really needs to be done. That's crocheted. I'm really close to it. I've got easily two thirds of it done and crocheting is fast. And so this week I moved that from not urgent and not important more towards urgent, but not important. So. I want to get it done, but it's not as it's not going to figure highly on my list like urgent and important or important but not urgent. That it's not important enough to to hit into those two categories. But I can move things around on the list between categories. All right. So essentially what I did was I went down that whole list of things I told you and I identified what is urgent and important and I'm doing those first. And what is urgent and important? Well, seeing my patients doing their chart notes. And I would say that's about it. Everything else is pretty much negotiable. Oh, no, also medicating captain's nose is on the list. I have to do that on a timeline. Okay, so you do your urgent and important things first. Then you look at what is important to you but not urgent. Now, if you do them second, you're now in the range of being proactive. Doing things that are important but are not urgent yet We'll keep them from becoming a crisis. We'll keep them from moving into urgent and important. Or if they do move into that category, they're not terrifying because you've got most of it done on a good timeline. So when it hits the point where this is urgent and I really have to finish it, I actually have most of it done and that will encourage you to finish it. That will help motivate you. So really what I'm doing is I'm saying you have to look at your projects as not urgent, but important, okay? So every day you say, what is urgent and important? And you get that done. And then you look at the rest of your projects and you decide, is this important, even if it's not urgent? And so after you finish working on urgent and important, you go into your list of things that are still important, but they are not urgent. And that's where you want to spend most of your time. Now you have the other categories, you have urgent but not important. And again, I would move things like knitting on a deadline into that. So I am going to try and get them done, but that is my third category. After I've done what's important and urgent, after I've done what's important and not urgent, then I will look at what is urgent and not important because that's artificial. 
like I've created this category vestuary and that's nice but nobody is in any serious trouble if I don't finish my vest by February 28th okay so you know not such a big deal and then the final category not urgent not important at this point that's just about all my craft projects except the wrapped in tiny chains and well I'd actually I'd say the wrapped in tiny chains may be the vestuary I really just want to get these things you know all, all these other projects I want to get them done but I don't want to get them done immediately now what did I do I just took away the whole motivation mess you say things like well I'm not motivated to go running or to exercise well you look at your exercise and you say what is that now when I was running all the time and running distance my exercise was interesting because I had a schedule and on my schedule I gave myself two days for every run so I would say it's a Monday morning and I want to run I don't know a mile and I get up it's pouring rain and there's mud everywhere and I think I'm just gonna wrench my ankle and I'm gonna get drenched and I don't feel like it it's cold and windy well fortunately I had Monday and Tuesday to do that run so on Monday it's in the category not urgent but important on Tuesday it is urgent and important that I'm gonna get up Tuesday morning and do that run because I want to get that off my calendar so I'm moving my items around in these four categories and in some situations I build in flexibility like I did three major runs a week and each run I had 48 hours to get that particular run done and so that really took away motivation that I didn't need to worry about motivation I just built it into the schedule and just said this is a thing I do and I treated it like the everyday so in a sense when I talk about motivation I really don't I talk about time management have you built this into your schedule do you have a place on your schedule that is dedicated to this activity and if you find you don't get it done like if I say I'm gonna run every Monday for a mile and I find I can't get it done it's not about my motivation it's about I have to get more flexible with my schedule so you can sort of reframe the way you look at motivation motivation isn't about this fire burning in you I must run this race motivation is more I build it into my schedule and I follow my schedule and I try not to ask too many questions once the schedule is in process and there will still be those of you who say but Gemma I want to be motivated I want to yearn to exercise that comes from a different place that motivation often comes from success so for example when I got diagnosed with diabetes I was motivated why I was terrified I know what happens to people with type 2 diabetes if they're not careful I was terrified so that was a form of motivation I kept looking at my son and thinking if I want to see him graduate college I'm gonna to have to do this I have to get rid of the weight and manage my diabetes so again there is the motivation that comes from feeling desperate feeling threatened so sometimes if you're saying well Gemma your time management thing isn't working for me all right then you need to sit down and say what are all the reasons I should do this thing so this is where creative struggle they say I want to write a novel but I don't have any money I need to work a job so I'm not giving myself enough time to write my novel so you have to sit down and say what happens if I don't write my novel it may not be that bad that you may realize I would really rather make money that it's fun to write a novel but it's even more fun to eat regularly and to be able to afford a car and so a lot of people give up on projects because they say this is not realistic based on my economic situation or some such thing like I could have a project of being the world's best canner of blueberry pie filling but since I'm a type 2 diabetic that's not a good idea because I'm probably going to end up sampling too much and raising my sugar so sometimes we do just say okay that canning project not realistic because I'm a diabetic sometimes in other words you may realize it wasn't such a good idea and you don't want to do it what I would tell you is if you keep saying I'm gonna write this novel I'm gonna write this novel I'm gonna knit this sweater whatever and you don't you need to sit down and say what am I doing instead because that's what you really want to do and you may say but but Gemma I'm working all the time I don't want to work all the time yeah you do 
because you're getting something out of that working. You may be walking around stressed and exhausted, but you have a really good reason to do it. It could be you need the money. It could be you don't know where to look for another job, whatever. So I would say there is that sort of desperation point motivation where you sit down and you have to build up your sense of your desperation. But I have found in the longer run, I do much better managing my motivation by using that time management system described in chapter five of the seven habits of highly effective people. That when I organize my time, I get a big thrill out of feeling proactive and feeling like I don't have deadlines creeping up on me. I keep everything in order and I work on every big project a little bit at a time so that nothing creeps up on me. So hopefully that's motivation. And I don't think it's what you want. I, I think people are always yearning to have their psychologist or their psychotherapist give them this package of here's how to get motivated. And I just saw a thing on the Tiny Buddha Official, I think it's called. It's a stream on Instagram where they were saying to get motivated, you can do it through neuropsychology by fixing your eyes on a point in the wall. I've never heard that, and I don't know why that would work. But sure, stare at a point on the wall if that's what you need to do. But I don't think it's about that. I think motivation comes from feeling as though you have an organized routine and you can stick to it. And the great thing about that is when you don't know what to do, you turn to your routine. When you don't know what to do, you turn to your to-do list, or your could-do list in my case. And I always have way more things on my list than I can do in one day because I put on it the things that I can't do today but that are coming up. So to me, again, motivation is about time management. And that involves using that four-quadrant system to classify each thing you want to get through and also using a very detailed list of all the possible things you could do today knowing you won't get them done so you're not hurting yourself or disappointing yourself. Ah, oh, the fluffy books. Well, I'm at the last book in the Jane Austen's Dragons series. I still can't figure out why I like them so much. I think the best thing I can say is all the human characters, they're women. They're not. I mean, there's male characters, but the good people, they're all women, even if they're male. And the dragons, they're all males that I think, no, there are female dragons. But I honestly think at some basic level, when you look at the Jane Austen's Dragons series, the dragons to the author, who's a woman, represent this kind of difference that often in days of yore, we would have ascribed to differences between the sexes. So I honestly think all the humans act very female in their way when they're being nice people. And all the dragons, when they're being nice people, or when they're not, so to say, because they have a whole different set of behaviors, I think they are basically how a teenage girl sees men. So I don't know. That's the best I can get out of it, but I am deeply, deeply enjoying it. My husband tells me to remind you about the classic movie, My Man Godfrey, which is William Powell and Carol Lombard. And I would say, if you have never seen this, you should see this. Do not watch the 1950s remake with David Niven. It's ridiculous. It's lost all the context. But My Man Godfrey is a screwball comedy from the 1930s that talks about class and poverty and wealth. And it talks about how one character escapes the trap of wealth by becoming poor and then escapes that trap and how he goes back to rescue both the rich and the poor from their stupidity and moral blindness. And in the case of the poor people, they don't have that problem. They have the poverty problem and he rescues them too. So if you're looking for a hilarious movie that is just loaded with valuable themes and thoughtful commentary about what goes wrong, when people are too rich or too poor, and it's set during the Great Depression, I really recommend you go look at the original My Man Godfrey. I cannot recommend it enough. It is hilarious, but it bears watching several times in a row because it makes just one jab after another 
at how we get it wrong and the cruelty of allowing people to sink into poverty where wealth exists. Believe it or not, we're back at all shoot. The bow, my son's bow has arrived. Now, I could not help posting the pictures. Christmas morning, he didn't have his bow and he's standing there posing on the right of the double picture. He's posing how he thinks you hold a bow and he looks awful if you're an archer, which I am. But you can't blame him because that's what you see on TV. You never really see what goes into archery. I would argue in the Avengers, if you watch Jeremy uh, Renner, I think it is, who plays Hawkeye, he does do the best you can do under the conditions they're putting the character in to look like he knows how to actually shoot. He doesn't do careless shots. He really does act as though he knows how to shoot. If you look at the second picture, which is on the left of the joined picture, I spent an hour with my son when the bow arrived in the house showing him before we would string it or do anything, just showing him this is your posture. I have to tell you, if you are an archer, you know this, but if you are not, it is all about the posture. If your feet are in the wrong position, you can't hit the target. And you start with your feet. It's like yoga. You start with your feet, you align them, you get your knees and your hips lined up above them, then you get your shoulders aligned, then you get your arms, and then you hold your bow, and then you can draw. And then you've got to hold it all really still and sight in on the target. And the great thing about archery is you get very, very good upper body strength. Here I sit at 62, a lifelong archer. Most women in America my age can't even lift a bag of groceries. I'm having fun with this 30 pound pull bow. That is 30 pounds of draw when you pull a string back. It's great. It is excellent for your upper body strength. It is excellent for your posture. I think for women, it's one of the best things you can do. It strengthens your back, your shoulders and your arms. I learned to shoot, well, when I was about 10 years old, my girlfriend and I were making our own bows out in the woods, but I really learned to shoot when I was about 13, and it is one of the great gifts of my life. So I am proud that my little archer has his bow, and so we are going to work on getting him out to a range as soon as we can figure out how to do that. But he's got all his gear. Also, I have gone back after last week's physical to my morning routine of stretching. I'm debating if I should do a video. It's kind of embarrassing. I'm not going to put on spandex or anything horrifying like that. But I keep thinking I should show you my routine because my stretching routine in the morning, currently I'm doing five minutes because I'm getting back into the hang of it again, motivation. And, you know, motivation, when you don't feel motivated, do it for 30 seconds. Do it for one minute. So I thought, no, it's not worth it. I decided to do it for five minutes and already I'm pushing that to more like seven or eight minutes but I've gone back to that and I feel so much better. My posture is better. My back has stopped aching. I'm sleeping like a log. Talk about benefits. But I do a mix of standing yoga and belly dance warm ups. So I start at my head and I do different types of head rotations based on belly dance. I do shoulder rotations based on belly dance, including rotating your bust your chest level, which is a thing that you don't see in yoga because yoga was invented by men for men. And basically they really don't do that much movement through the base of their neck to their hips. Whereas women are very flexible in that area and moving it and having it limber is very flattering if I do say so myself. And it's great for our posture. So then, you know, I work my way down the spine, you know, through hip rotations and sort of hip back and forth and up and down work. And then I go down to the knees. Then I do runner stretches on my legs and Achilles tendons. And then I will sit down and do a cobbler's pose and try to stretch out uh, my up, the insides of my upper legs. So I've got a nice routine going and I'm trying to normalize it. If I get good at it, I'll do a video of what the moves are. So there we go. I'll shoot us back. Something I really like, flannel sheets. It's that time of year. I like to get my sheets from either J.C. Penney or L.L. Beans. They both have a really nice selection of prints. I have ha found that both of them hold up about equally well. I'm really big on these things. These make all the difference in the cold weather. And here in Southern California, sitting on the side of a mountain at 3,200 feet, where we have not really had snow this year. I think we had like one morning where we got dusted. We've had a lot of rain and all that, and I have to tell you, there's nothing like flannel sheets. 
when it's damp and cold. I believe in a lot of pillows and extremely comfortable sheets. And also, yes, I'm also using the heating pad in my bed to warm up the bed and keep me warm at night because we're in the 30s up here. And it's been just beautiful. But something I really like, get yourself some good flannel sheets. Get everybody in the house good flannel sheets. It's January, so the white sails are on. I just bought three sets of sheets, including flannels for my son, because he needs some new sheets. I am a household linens fan. And I think one of these days I'd like to sit down and just get plain white pillowcases and start embroidering them in the good Pennsylvania German way that was popular in my youth. Put a lid on it. The tea tastings continue. Nothing really special this week. I was drinking the eggnog oolong from Plum Deluxe, and for some reason it doesn't taste as good to me. I suspect it's a freshness issue. I still do recommend it. I just think oolong is the cat's pajamas. I think it's great tea, and Plum Deluxe does a really nice one. I also would tell you the Plum Deluxe fans group over on Facebook is a really nice bunch of people. What else? What else? I am drinking the vanilla from Harney and Sons. It's just not even memorable. When you drink it, it just tastes like a black tea. I'm pretty sure they're sugaring that baby in some way. So, you know, I'm lukewarm on the vanilla from Harney and Sons. I've just got a lot of tea. I'm really working my way through the house blends. Currently, the house blends the eggnog oolong from Plum Deluxe and the chocolate mint from Harney and Sons, although I suspect that's been sugared. Those are the things I'm kind of digging into a lot right now. I'm enjoying the Uva Highlands from Harney and Sons, which is supposed to be Ceylon. It's not a particularly good Ceylon. I'm looking back at Dilma, another company, and I, I think they're out of Hong Kong or something. They do a loose leaf Ceylon, and I may move over to that. Plum Deluxe, since they don't put sugar in the guarantee it, I have a long way to go in those tastings. I am still enjoying the strawberry cream black tea. That is nice stuff. And their Earl Grey, they do a, a fruit Earl Grey, like a non-caffeine, and I'll get back to it. The perfect diet. Well, you will see. First of all, in the show notes, I put a picture of the keto pumpkin spice earthquake cake along with a nice cup of hot tea. And also I have this big poster thing about eating bacon, about how eating bacon is eating better, mainly because I just thought it was hilarious. The last thing is don't eat turkey bacon. But I, I like the eating better thing. It's a very keto declaration of how bacon works for us. I don't know who made this up. I think there is an attribution stamp on it. And I can't really tell how serious they were about it. But I really want to come back to talking about diet because every time I talk about keto, people get offended. And I get all these things about why they can't do keto. You know, the interesting thing is a successful diet is the diet you can stick to. But when I mention keto and I talk about the success I've had, someone will always say, well, that's because you were so disciplined and other people just aren't like you which is a, a nice kind of compliment. And then somebody else gets their feelings hurt and says, no, I did it, but it's too restrictive, blah, blah, blah. Look, you just can't go rubber stamping people about their diets. As I've said before, I have friends who've been vegan since their 20s. They've done really well on it. I can't do vegan. I can't digest the protein in beans. So I can't get enough protein on a vegan diet. So my vegan nutritionist after three years begged me to stop. The reality is people have different physiologies. So finding the diet that works for you may be an ongoing hunt. And you shouldn't hear anybody who says, oh, I love this diet. Now, there are diet Nazis. We know they're out there. The medical community has been really resistant to keto. They can't give a good reason that I've seen so far. And there is a very strong subgroup of doctors that support low-carb, high-fat, which is really what keto is. So even that is not pure, but it is really amazing how some d doctors just get really hostile about it and demand you eat vegetables. And I, I don't know, like maybe their mommy made them eat a lot of peas at dinner. I don't know what that's about, but I think if you do better on vegetables, you do better on vegetables. What I think you have to look at, if you're a type 2 diabetic, not a type 1, 
Type 1, they are born without the ability to manufacture insulin. That is a whole different disease, and I am not commenting on them. That's, I don't even know how you manage that, but I salute them. If you are a type 2 diabetic, there is a very realistic chance that you are insulin resistant and carbohydrate addicted. And those two things go together in ways we don't perfectly understand. So please keep in mind, when I'm extolling keto, I'm talking about it in the situation of four type 2 diabetes. And if you say it doesn't work for your type 2 diabetes, I'm not going to argue with you. You have to see what works for you. What is my criteria for working? As my doctor pointed out, she said, you've been five years with this diagnosis and your A1C is normal. You're not taking any meds. Your blood pressure is good. You're living a normal life. And she said, I don't see patients like you. Yeah, that's my criteria. Do with it as you will. Now, for a lot of good reasons, those may not be your criteria for success. For one thing, maybe you can't digest parts of the diet. You know, people write in and say, I can't tolerate the fat, whatever. Yeah, I'm not going to argue with you. Other people have said, I am down that road. Like I got diabetes years ago and I'm working my way through it, but I have other health conditions. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. You're not going to do keto. You're not going to do what I'm doing. You know, somebody wrote in and said, I'm on a renal diet and I have to avoid protein. Yeah, you're not going to do keto. So you just have to be real that the perfect diet is going to be what works for you. And that phrase, what works for you, you've really got to sit down and do your homework. What would that look like? So please don't take it too much to heart. But I am going to always promote keto, that I think that's what I do, that's what works for me. Do I think everybody should be on it? No. But I also think there's not a lot of coherent podcasts that talk about it, and I think it's fair to talk about it. But again, no, I, I'm not trying to convert you. Do what you will, but I do want you to know what has been a success for me, because that's kind of what everybody's podcast is about, what works for them. On to the bladder, well, I gave up, and this was hard. I gave up on ASL 102. I just can't do it because of my schedule. So instead, I switched to ASL 110, which is deaf culture, which I've already read all the books for and a few extra. So hopefully that won't be too bad. The teacher is deaf, but you don't have to do sign in the class. She's going to have an interpreter. So because of scheduling issues, 102, they did add sections in the summer, that's still going to be a challenge, but it might be doable. We will see. Otherwise, I will do 102 in the fall, and I will just keep practicing. I've got all the textbooks. It's very disappointing. And again, the question becomes, well, why even do this at all? Language is one of the best things you can do for yourself in so many ways. I have always studied language. I have even developed a language. That's how I got my undergrad degrees pushed up to honors degrees. I cannot tell you how much I've won in my life by being fortunate enough to be forced to take Latin in high school. And again, if I could study no other language on this planet, I would study classical Latin because it just set me up for everything else that has worked so well for me. Is that true for all of you? No, not really. It depends on what you want to do in the world. But Latin has really helped me. Now, the other thing is, if it wasn't Latin, it would be ASL that ASL takes you into this other dimension of language where it's all visual. And when I was creating my own language, I constantly got the question, are you trying to make a world language, an easy, effective world language? Don't be ridiculous. That would be incredibly challenging at that level that I was at at the time. But a lot of my colleagues in the English department at the University of Pennsylvania could not understand why would you just create a language? And a lot of them were stunned because they just never thought of it, even though they were all reading Tolkien, who created languages. So all I can say is the ability to manipulate language is a mental flexibility. It improves brain power. People who study language are more mentally flexible, and they tend to have higher intelligence. Sorry, but it's true. Now, as I age, the reason I'm doing it is that the study of a foreign language is excellent for staving off things like Alzheimer and keeping the patient really focused and alert, that it's challenging, it's stimulating, it's interesting. It leads to new social bridges and communication. 
I have to tell you, I'm just having a blast. ASL is, I just love doing it. So also, by the way, in California, there is a program, Free ASL for Seniors. I've seen that go by on the ASL Facebook groups. I have not looked into it yet. And if you did not know it, you should know that many classes in California community colleges are free for people over the age of, I don't know if it's 60 or 65, but they wanna make free education for older people. So this is a fine time to study another language. If I wasn't doing ASL, I would probably redo Spanish. I'd like to sharpen up my Spanish again because it's so insanely useful where I live. But I do highly recommend that you learn ASL. It is amazingly useful in ways I never thought I'd see. And as you're aging, it's even better. And yeah, there's also the reality. As you're aging, you might become hard of hearing. And yes, it's true. There's one study, and I'd love to see it replicated, where people who know ASL, if they go into managed care, they do a whole lot better because they meet other people who know ASL. And while everybody else is having trouble communicating, they're just signing away and doing great. That it seems to work very well under that extreme situation. We only have one study on it, but I really hope it's right and I hope it's followed up on. Seniors in programs with ASL in managed care homes are much more happy with their care and their social world. I think it's fantastic because, of course, if you're going deaf, you want to use sign. And that's probably why there's a California program to teach sign to seniors. And that leads me to say the next thing. So if at this point you're saying, wow, that's great. My elderly grandmother or someone should go off and learn ASL. Here's a news flash. So should you. So you can talk to her. Has it ever dawned on everybody? What would it be like if the whole family had this sign language as a second language. So if somebody is going deaf, you can still communicate. And then you can bend your brain around the fact you can use sign in social situations. If someone can't hear you, you can sign it to them. It is an amazingly useful thing. I cannot recommend ASL enough. The pup date. We are looking at a dog nose protector. You can buy this custom made online. And it's for discoid lupus. This is what Eleanor had, and this is what Captain has. Why I got two dogs in a row who have it, I can't tell you. Captain is getting her nose medicated twice a day, and it is sort of healing, except she licks the meds off, and she also digs with her nose. So we're looking at that dog nose protector. It's 45 bucks. It seems very worthwhile if we can keep it on her. Meanwhile, the three girls are doing great. Blankets, who's got to be 15. We're not really sure since she was a, an adoption, a foster home. And Blankets deals with Captain and Queenie like they are her babies and her little sisters. So now all day long while I'm seeing patients, Blankets, the old German Shepherd, is running in and out of my room, moaning. And I finally realized, I kept saying, are you hungry? Do you want to go out? No. She is telling me, the girls are outside. My puppies are outside. You've got to let the puppies in. They've got to be with me. Yeah, it's very endearing. I never expected to have the three girls together. I really didn't think blankets would go this long. She's got spectacular health. She is starting to have some issues with her hind legs, but it's very rare. She'll be walking across the hardwood floor and she'll somehow just miss and they'll slide out from under her. But, you know, for a dog her age, I mean, most German Shepherds, their legs go out a lot earlier. She's doing wonderfully. The hubs date, the hubs is doing fine. Eyes are good, everything is stable. We are now in that phase, we're going to dentists and getting mammograms done, well, me, not him, and we're just doing that winter phase where you get all your medical stuff caught up, so that's really nice. The calendar, the Grand Canyon is still on the calendar, and Sunnybank is still on the calendar. We will just have to see how they go. In the meantime, Minerva gets the last word, and her last word is, it's time to enjoy a long winter's nap. This is the slow, quiet, dark time of the year where we sit by the fire, drink hot drinks, wear all our hand-knitted goods, enjoy those socks we knitted and wondered if we'd ever use, wear long skirts over our leggings. Okay, it's just me. I bought two more from Holy Clothing last week, and I'm waiting for them to arrive. But, you know, I have a picture of myself with Minerva in my lap taken through my spotty mirror, which so it looks very dusty. But we're just sitting there and it says the 
the absolute truth. Some days you're just at home with your cat. And that is an okay thing to do at this time of year. But don't forget, do all your COVID stuff. You know, wash your hands, wear your mask in crowded situations, keep your distance, get your shots, but also make time to just sit at home and enjoy a long winter's nap. Oh, a long winter's nap. I mean, just enjoy these slow, calm days of winter and wear your warm clothes and be comfy and snug at home. And with those happy thoughts, I'm going to say everybody remember to stay safe, take care of each other, and I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye. So we have come to the end of another episode of Cognitive. Please do not use this podcast to diagnose yourself. If you think you are having a mental health problem, please contact a licensed mental health professional. Show notes for these episodes can be found at cognitivepodcast, all one word, dot blogspot.com. Episodes can be found at iTunes under the name Cognitive Podcast, but also can be found posted next to the show notes on the blog spot page. Thank you so much for listening. Everybody stay safe, take care of each other, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.